towards Inverness. As you leave Strathspey and the Cairngorms behind, the landscape around you begins to change once more. The train will carry you through forests and over open moorland before the line starts to drop down through farms and woods. You'll skirt the edge of Culloden Battlefield, the site of the final crushing defeat of Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite army. Then, as you hurtle down the final steepest hill, you may catch glimpses of the sea in the Murray Firth and hills to the north. The train will soon arrive in Inverness, the Highland capital, a fast-growing city which serves an area the size of Belgium. Inverness lies on the Murray Firth, where the North Sea flows into the Great Glen. This is an immense geological fault line stretching all the way to Fort William and beyond in the west. It's been active for over 400 million years, when plate tectonic forces first brought fragments of Scotland's crust together. Initially, the movement on the north side of the fault was at least 125 miles southwestward. Subsequently, the shift was to the northeast. Most recently, repeated glaciation has carved out the zone of crushed rock along the line of the fault, almost cutting Scotland in two, forming the deep trough we know as the Great Glen. People have used the Great Glen as a natural route through the highlands for over 8,000 years. Nowadays, the route's enhanced by the Caledonian Canal. It runs through the glen, linking Loch Ness and other freshwater lochs, and provides a passage for boats to travel between Inverness and Fort William. Many people come to the Murray Firth to watch and get close to one of Scotland's best-loved mammals, the bottlenose dolphin. This really is one of the finest places to observe these fascinating creatures. The Murray Firth is home to around 120, between 40 and 50 percent, of all the bottlenose dolphins in Scottish coastal waters. And these, along with those elsewhere along the east coast, form the most northerly resident population of bottlenose dolphins in the world. Ben Lation is a scientist who's involved in studying them. The only other dolphin population in the world that's studied more than this one is one in Florida. Um, so this is kind of the second most studied population, and there's still a lot we don't know about it. But compared to other populations, you know, we actually understand it quite well. So we know pretty much how many animals there are. We know, um, you know, the social structure, so roughly how many females, males, juveniles form that population. We know roughly the number of new animals that are born every year and how long they're likely to survive. So all of this information has been gathered since 1989. These dolphins live in small groups and often work together to catch fish. They also feed on squid, crabs and other shellfish, using their powerful conical teeth to crush outer shells and bones with ease. Sometimes the dolphins are incredibly active, leaping out of the water, turning and flipping their tails. Phil Barda lives with his family on the shores of the Murray Firth and they often go out to watch the dolphins. Some of the best places locally to see dolphins is uh, Channery Point, which is sort of the, uh, the, uh, the archetypal totemic place to go for, for dolphins. And you can get very, very close and go to the end of the Smith, and the dolphins can be breaching literally feet away from you, almost touching distance, and that's absolutely wonderful. My youngest daughter, six year old, likes the most is this thing that called spy hopping, which is when a dolphin comes out of the water so far that it starts to balance on its tail and it's there looking around, spying, like a periscope almost. Uh, it's, it's slightly vibrating, slightly moving, and it's just a, a very exciting moment when that happens. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's a very, very exciting thing, a very, very moving, magical thing to see. 